and ABC Sport welcomes you to Amaru Park on the outskirts of Sydney, the site for the 1979 Castrol six-hour endurance race for production bikes. A huge, enthusiastic crowd building up for one of the classics of motorsport on Australia's motorsport calendar. The, the conditions here at Amaru Park, thankfully for the riders and their trackside workers, overcast and quite cool, very comfortable at the moment. The 10-minute signal has just gone. Let's have a look at the circuit closely, your commentator, Will Hagen. This is the 1.9 kilometre Amaru Park circuit at better than a minute, an average of 120 kilometres an hour. Roger Hayes there on the XS 1100 Yamaha being followed by the Australian touring car champion Bob Morrison. We're indebted to him and to Ron Hodgson Motors who supplied the pursuit car for this exercise. This is the Dunlop loop. Accelerating hard out of there, picking up a gear, flat through this sweeper, up another gear, top gear, feathering, and now into it through the right-hand Mazda corner. Down to Honda, heavy brakes here. Keep it straight and hard into Honda corner, a slow corner, 80 kilometres an hour. Got to get the line right through that right-hand kink, short straight down to Rothman, stop corner. No escape, rising right-hander. Onto the short straight up to Ron Hodgson corner in the pit area, sweeping through that fast right-hander, and then the straight again, and now hard up the straight, and up towards this fast sweeper at maximum speed. And now get on the bike with us, you're the pillion passenger. Watch the speedo and the taco and the horizon as we come up to the top of Bitchapave Hill, now to the Dunlop loop. Roger Hayes riding the big XS 1100 Yamaha, cranked over as hard and as far as he can go. Again accelerating hard down through the right-hander being passed by Alan Blanco. Hard right-hander again, you hear the bike working all the way and down to Honda corner. right-handed is so important for the run down to Rothman's corner and you watch Blanco in front as he comes out of Rothman's corner and just gets a bit crossed up. Heavy brakes here. The short straight to Ron Hodgson corner. Working all the way on these big powerful bikes. And then to the start finish line in about 57 seconds. All in readiness now with 30 seconds to go for this classic production motorcycle race. A clash between the four Japanese manufacturers, their biggest and most powerful bikes from Kawasaki, Honda, Yamaha and Suzuki. More than $20,000 in prize money and trophies. The unique Le Mans start and the starter Tony Burnett, the marketing director of Castrol. And they go for the Le Mans start when the flag rises. Ready to rise. Flag's rolling now. The national flag. Crosby early to the bike. Greg Pretty first away on number 12. Greg Pretty got the jump there, the South Australian who last year so audaciously diced with Graham Crosby early in the race there. Dennis Neal tucked in behind him, who won pole position yesterday on the 900 Honda. So it's Yamaha 1100, non Honda 900, in the first two positions. Followed in third place by number 11, Wes Cooley, the American. Didn't have a happy time last year, but beautifully placed at the moment. A Honda 900. 39 bikes in this classic race, and into Honda corner. Fourth place is number 14, Ron Bolden, the young teenager, 19 years old and a brilliant Australian motorcycle rider. No doubt in the future heading for overseas honours. Here they are, Dennis Neal out wide, but still Greg Pretty, the diminutive South Australian leading. Neil Cooley, followed then on 14 by Bolden and on one by Roger Hayes, Yamaha 1100 and twice winner of the race previously, up the top for the second lap. The Dunlop loop where so many people have come adrift. The settling in period while they warm up tyres and brakes, get themselves into gear, settle down their nerves from that, that tremendously tense Le Mans start. And into the lead goes Dennis Neal of number two, but too wide, too wide. Oh, within six inches of coming adrift. 
so close there and a very risky manoeuvre by Dennis Neal on the 900 Honda. He holds the lap record here at 57.6 and he was just a tenth of a second outside it yesterday in setting pole position. But look at Pretty under control. It was Pretty last year that was going hard, trying to hold Crosby and who was getting the bike weaving and wandering. And look at Bolden tucked in behind them. Bolden hasn't featured much in this race in previous years, but Bolden moving up on the leading trio and putting a lot of pressure on them there on bike number 14. An enormous riding talent who doesn't ride production bikes a lot. Going well. But still Pretty. Dennis Neal on numbers 12 and 2, followed by the American, Cooley on 11, and Bolden on 14. Further back, it's Roger Hayes on 1 in 5th place. Dennis Neal trying again. Will he complete it, or will he go wide again? He holds it. So Dennis Neal into the lead, Honda CB900, the bike that yesterday locked up the motor or transmission through the lead Honda rider, Tony Hatton, down the road, and therefore he's unable to ride today. But Neal with an enormous amount of power on this time of the bike, and Freddie wanting to go with him, but Neal wanting to set off and set his own pace. It was one of these bikes that gave him the outright lap record back in June. Hill. Dennis Neal now on two. Is he going to try and run away? Freddy, 12. Bolden into third. Cooley back to fourth. And Bolden just grounding the foot peg there as you saw. They have to start the race with brand new as out of the showroom foot pegs and mufflers. So the early part of the race, they'll be wearing them away, actually grinding them away through the Dunlop loop and some of the other corners. And finally, they'll probably finish the race about half the length of the standard item. Look at Dennis Neal moving away. Big man, really can ride that 900 Honda. Probably the fastest bike in production racing. Not the most powerful, but the combination of lightweight and power makes it about the fastest bike on a racetrack at the moment in production four. Dennis Neal, the sprinter, trying to move away. Pretty, not like last year, not mixing it at this stage. Perhaps content to let him go, but Bolden pressuring him. Further back on eight, in front of uh, Roger Hayes is David Hiscock. In trouble, we believe, on number three with brakes, is the Victorian team of Rob Phillips and Andrew Johnson. Rob Phillips wasn't happy this morning. He said the bike was too slow, but the bike itself was all right. He reckoned it was he and his co-rider that weren't quite in the groove. In front of eight, you can see Malcolm Campbell on the Honda 900, number 16. This is the one in trouble. Going up the hill, a very talented wet weather rider. Like nine there is Glenn Atlee, the winner of the first Castrol 6 hour back in 1970. This is the young Victorian, Rob Phillips. So good in the wet. Rides production bikes a lot for the Millage team, but as well as that, rides out and out racing bikes, TZ 350 and 750 Yamaha. There he is around Honda Corner. Three laps into the race, Gary Thomas is into the pits. Gary, what's happened? Um, we started the, the race. It seems like we had a um, binding rear brake. Um, about five corners later, I just locked the back brake and young Emmanuel and the pie team hit the back of the bike and couldn't go. I did another lap. Um, and the bike was just stopping, the brakes were locked on, and so we've stopped. How's your ankle? Um, I don't really know yet. doesn't feel very well. Is it broken? I don't know. don't know. Freddy coming through on uh, Five Night. But look at Bolden up front, pressuring Dennis Neal. Bolden, the race bike specialist. Dennis Neal, the production bike specialist. He doesn't ride racing bikes. Bob Levy, team manager of the Gary Thomas bike, what's happened? John, it's here, it appears that we've um, had someone tamper with our bike last night in a 
a trickery uh, sort of an effort to slow us up and they've tightened our rear brake up so bad it was binding and it locked the wheel up on the dead stop corner on Gary and uh, one of the other guys centre popped him and it's broken his foot. Are you saying deliberate sabotage? Well it appears that way to me John, I, uh, we've done well over a thousand laps here this week with the same adjustment on the rear brake and at this stage it didn't do one half lap. Have you got a relief rider? We do have one. He hasn't practiced this week, so we're out of it completely. We're just going to run around for six hours. That's it. Ron Bolden falling off the back when he's struggling for the lead. Ron Bolden actually has hit the front and been challenging Dennis Neal for the lead, but he's thrown the bike away, number 14. Up in the Dunlop loop, and he is down when holding first place, in fact. He was in front of Dennis Neal. As you can see, he's pretty tossed around and uh, shaken up. Well, what a turn up at this early stage of the race on lap 17. Completed 16 laps, had hit the front in front of Dennis Neal. And now the uh, one of the leading Yamaha 1100 riders, Ron Bolden. Not at all well, as you can see. And there's the co-rider Stephen Gall, Mr. Motocross for 1978. But uh, starting in his second Castrol 6R, going up the top to see if the bike is usable and to take his place in the field. Pointer is down. How do you feel? I'll let you know when I see how he is. He was riding very, very hard. Mm, I know. What do you but think? I thought he had done the control. He was... I don't know. I'll wait to see how he is. After being a bit reluctant to fire, the Yamaha's fired up. You can understand it with the, the flooding that would occur when it's thrown on its side. But now Gaul has got it fired up, the number two rider on number 14. Bolden on his feet happily. He's hurt his ankle but presumably not broke it. broken it. They've missed seven laps at this stage. And Gaul about to get away. So it looks as though it needs attention because as you can see, he's not going quickly. The bike a bit uh, screwed up and heading back to the pits at very much reduced pace. Where's Cooley, the American riding bike number 11, who competed in the 6R last year, but was a bit unhappy about the way the race went. And at this stage, lying third outright, with 25 laps completed, has to, of course, have a race strategy and to work out how to pace himself against the other top riders. Uh, six hour racing to me is more like a long sprint race. Uh, we're going to try to get out in the front uh, as best we can to begin with and uh, hoping that uh, everything stays that way. Um, I think that there are going to be a few people that are probably going a little bit faster than we will be in the beginning, but uh, they don't necessarily last the whole duration. I think uh, as long as we can keep the leaders in sight and if possible lead it ourselves and then wait till say the last uh, hour and a half and that's where we're going to try to do our most of our work I think. Uh, Hopefully everybody else may be tiring out a little bit, and uh, Dunlop's going to do a real good thing. We're going to have a masseur here and everything to keep us, uh, the riders, physically fit for it, and I think that that'll help us in the end. Steve, Ron Bolden's partner, what's the situation with the bike, and how's Ronnie? Well, Ronnie's OK. I just ran up to the top of the hill and talked to him. He said that Dennis Neal dived right underneath him and, and took him out. I don't know whether that's true, but that's just what he told me. Um, he's OK. He's walking around up there. We're going to try to get the bike back together. We don't stand much chance now, but at least we'll get out there again and try. In Rothman's corner, bike number three, the Victorian team of Rob Phyllis and Andrew Johnson, tangled with another bike, but they're down. Another of the Yamaha 1100s out. They weren't too happy with the form of the bike in practices, but uh, were running well, but now down on the lap, on lap 28. Roger Hayes riding bike number one, which surprisingly was 15th in qualifying yesterday because Rogers won this race twice previously mixing it with the traffic there and a lot of lap bikes that the riders are constantly encountering now but he's placed in 8th position so he's improved 7 positions on his starting position and this is the bike that hopes to eke out the 24 litre fuel tank capacity to 2 hours of running it's never been done before by a Yamaha 1100 but that's what Roger Hayes is doing he's on a high speed economy run on bike number one. 
His second place, Dennis Neal, was the leader, was involved uh, in the claim of Ron Bolden in that incident where Ron Bolden fell off. He's fallen back now to second place. Here's the race leader, Alan Hales, on the Suzuki GS1000. The man that had a, a lead of more than a lap last year when he fell off back there in the Dunlop loop, dicing with a rider that he thought was on the same lap as he. A production by Grace specialist desperately wants to win the race and retirement is starting to enter the mind of a 30-year-old Sydney motorcycle dealer. In fact, if he were to win today, he probably would announce his retirement. So he leads the race at the moment, but not by very much, from Dennis Neal on the Honda 900. Third place, David Hiscock and uh, Peter Fleming, the New Zealand pair, on another Suzuki 1000. That's bike number eight. Fourth place, Wes Cooley on 11. Dennis Neal in second place going to the pits because he's been given a black flag on bike number two, 40 laps into the race, coming round to complete 41, being accused of dangerous riding by Ron Bolden, Tony Hatton. Is this possible for the officials to do it? Yeah, it's quite possible, uh, Will. Uh, not, not seeing the accident, uh, you know, we can't uh, give our opinion on it, really, but I guess uh, if Bolden's in there complaining, he's obviously done something. And changing to uh, Alan Decker... Dennis what Neal, Ron, hey, Ron Bolden says you rode dangerously and brought him down. What's your answers to that? No way, no, we were dicing going into the corner. We just hit. Did you have in any way bring him down? We hit, but I had the corner, I was on the inside. They black flagged you and brought you in. How do you feel about that? Oh. Is that what I come in for? And this is what it's all about. The battered bike number 14, now being ridden by the motocross expert Stephen Gall, and you can see how gingerly Gall is treating that bike, because it was the lead rider for that, uh, Ron Bolden, as you heard, that claims he was brought down by Dennis Neal when they were dicing for the lead. Tony Hatton, traffic is very tight, and everybody dives, of course, for the same line up in Dunlop Loop, but down here at Honda Corner there's some drama. A bike's gone into the bank, we can see it's the lead rider for bike number 16, Malcolm Campbell and Rodney Cox. Honda CB900. Tony, everybody seems to be having their share of problems in the various makes. We've seen various of the Yamahas run into trouble, but dreadfully bad luck for the Honda Dennis Neal to be brought into the pits on the back flag. You must feel very closely to that being involved with the Hondas. <laughs> oh, well, uh, there's two sides to everything yeah. here, Will. And, uh, <laughs> Your bike's going well. Uh, yeah, but uh, Dennis is a great rider. He's a, a really wild guy on a motorcycle. I'm not saying that... Uh, he uh, caused the accident, but uh, when you get tangled with him, you, it's sure, you know, you think you've got a tiger by the tail. It's been said before that he's forceful. Would that be... Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> But, yeah. Tony, that can be very dicky on a bike because uh, what might be a dented panel on a car and a bike can result, obviously, in a crash. Yeah. Would you be prepared to trust Dennis Neal in close racing as you trusted, for instance, Gary Thomas at Bathurst at Easter? Uh, no way. Uh, well, I, I think I'd sort him out a lot quicker than that. <laughs> <laughs> the personality and one of the very biggest talents in Australian motorcycle racing, Graham Crosby, here riding bike number four, which he'll be sharing in the race with one of the international riders, Akihiro Kiyohara. But few people have greater talent than Crosby, who next year may well go to Europe to contest the World 500cc Championship. Well, it's going to be a change of tactics this year, for sure, because I, I, I've had so many races where we've basically sort of led from the start or qualified fastest or done something up the front all the time, right at the start of the race, and it's just getting to a point where I'm getting sick of it. <laughs> I want to be around at the end for a change. Most of the times I'm sit, uh, you know, I'm stuck in the, in, the, in the pit area and the race is still going, I'm half drunk, you know. <laughs> I want to be there at the end for the champagne. A real character. Uh, that belies a very serious and very talented approach to racing. We see here him dicing with the American Wes Cooley. Wes Cooley's in third place. Crosby in front of him means that Crosby is third, has put Cooley back to fourth as they go up the hill. So uh, he might reckon there's a change of tactics on and he doesn't want to scrap up at the front. But uh, this man can ride so quickly that uh, almost he can't help himself, Tony, in running towards the front.
So here we are up in the Dunlop loop and there's the lap score at the completion of 51 laps. Still Alan Hales in the lead on the Suzuki 1000, followed by David Hiscock from New Zealand on eight. That's another Suzuki. Then in four, Crosby moving up on the Z1R Kawasaki. Where's Cooley the American on the Honda 900, the best place to that make, number 11. And 12, Greg Pretty, XS 1100 Yamaha in fifth. And then in sixth place, the Alan Decker Dennis Neal bike uh, can't be there, so that's the wrong number for sixth place. Well, Tony Hatton, I can see uh, Ken Blake doing a great job still there on bike number five, pressuring Roger Hayes on one. When is the first pit stop due? One hour, 15 minutes, uh, Will. And how does that put you against the other bikes, the Z1R Kawasaki's, the Suzuki 1000's, and the Yamaha 1100's? A slight disadvantage on the 1100 Yamaha and a slight disadvantage on the Kawasaki 1000. But we have one extra stop bike fast enough to make up for that? I think so, yeah. We'll find out later in the race. And what about John Warrior? Will he go on to it at this first stop? Yes, yes, he'll be on at the first stop. Will. And then Ken Blake back onto it at the end of that session? Yes, yes. And then John will do a second session yes. later on. And how do you feel about him? He's only done how many laps of practice? He's done uh, maybe uh, 40, 40 laps of practice, I'd say. Right. You weren't drawing your breath in there, were you, as you watched them flying down to Rothman's corner? <laughs> I was, actually, because uh, I know from riding this motorcycle, it's very hard to pass uh, the 1100 Yamahas, and uh, Ken's finding it out right, right now. In what area? The talk of the Yamahas out of corners? Yeah, the Yamahas are uh, a little slower into the corners. As you can see there, he's blocking Ken, and then, uh, but they accelerate much faster out of the corners. So it's a real problem. Number 19 with the 36 on his helmet is young John Pace, 20 years old and the fastest man ever around Amaru Park on two wheels because at the August meeting here he had a brilliant run on his TZ 350 racing Yamaha and he broke the 750cc outright record for the Amaru Park circuit and that sort of form, that sort of knowledge of the Amaru Park circuit has slotted him up into first place at this stage in the 750 class on bike number 19. He's sharing it with Wayne Gardner and they're leading second place in the class number 39 that's Brown and Bobby Greger on yet another Z650 Kawasaki. But John Pace, formerly a dirt rider, and now into road racing, unassuming modest, in fact was to share originally the CB900 Honda with Tony Hatton. But what a flyer and what a young talent is this 20-year-old. Where's Cooley into the pits? He's in fifth place outright on bike number 11. Coming in now, one hour, 13 minutes into the race of the CB900 Honda. That means, of course, that bike five's due to be in soon and the race leader, Alan Hales, on bike number six. Here's Alan Hales. He, too, has about similar range to the CB900. He is the race leader on the GS1000 Suzuki. Is this his pit stop on bike number six? Hales, the race leader, who has been in the lead for 39 laps, comes into the pits. And so, at this moment, the race leader becomes David Hiscock and Peter Fleming on bike eight. Crosby on bike number six goes, at night bike four goes into second place. And with a strict 30 kilometre an hour limit into the pits. It's Alan Hales in the pits now. 20 litres of fuel, super fuel going in. Neil Shivers getting on the bike. They've been in for 10 seconds. They expected to do it in eight. They're running late right now. 15 seconds. It's a slow pit stop for the leader. Fuel pouring over the engine. Smoke going. He's hit the, hit the starter. 18.2 seconds. Alan Hales, how does the bike feel? Hang on while I get my helmet off. Right now, how does the bike feel? Feels great. No problem. No problems at all. Ken Blake. Now with an enormous responsibility on his shoulders on bike five coming to the pits. He too has got one and a quarter hour range on the CB900 Honda and in he goes. He'll hand over to John Warrion who only yesterday at around lunchtime was requested to uh, start practicing on the bike. He had to send his, get his letters brought down from Queensland and step onto the vehicle. He's in ninth place at the moment and with the 
20 odd laps of practice, Warrion takes his place on the bike. Yesterday by the team, after Tony Haddon had his fall, now on the bike, 15 seconds, a slow stop again. Bike started, Haddon slams down the cap, and it's off in 22 seconds, very slow. And Murray Hill, Michael Cork sharing the fourth fastest 750 in qualifying the Yamaha XS 750 a New Zealander Murray Hill Michael Cork a local but bad luck for them down at Rothman's corner yellow flags out and they in the meantime trying to wheel the bike back to the pits to see if it needs repair and perhaps to hand over to a co-rider Tony Hatton you sent Ken Blake off you wouldn't let him talk to us why not we're too busy he's uh, <coughs> we want him out of his gear and relaxed and um, nobody talking to him for for the one hour we want him to uh, settle down and um, be fresh for the next hour are you sure there isn't a problem no problem no problem at all I've got the problems he hasn't got the problems <laughs> So Graham Crosby, race leader on the Kawasaki, Z1R Mark II, after having rid the late race briefly, now in for the first pit stop. And Crosby staying on the bike, he's going out again for the second stint. The time, 21.2. Graham Crosby waving to the crowd there. <laughs> so relaxed on a racing bike, he's unbelievable. And does have the offer of a big contract from Suzuki Japan to compete in the class in world motorcycle racing, uh, the 500cc class next year. Uh, around 30 races in both Formula One and World Championship racing. Well, we're watching Wes Cooley, the American production champion, in after his first stint in the six hour. Wes, is this the normal procedure for you in America? Uh, no, actually, this is the first time this has been done. Uh, we tried to do this in all the 24 hour races. Um, it just it just relaxes you up. Um, you know, you come in, and if there's a little bit of problem with, uh, say, muscles getting tight, like my brake hand right now is really tight in my forearm. And it's just kind of a, it's a mental thing, too, you know, basically, uh, you know, it helps out your muscles, but. Uh, yeah, there is, it's a mental, it makes me feel better. I get kind of psyched up, ready to go back out again. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty good procedure, actually. I'm, I'm glad they thought of it. I didn't really think of it, so. At the end of lap 89, the position after the pit stops for all but the Yamaha XS 1100s. Greg Pretty on one of those Yamahas and the very strong co-rider of Jim Budd, twice the race winner, into the lead. Alan Hales, after a pit stop, still holding second. Hiscock Fleming, the New Zealand team in third place. Fourth place on nine, Len Attlee, Gary Coleman, another of the Yamahas. Then Crosby, again a pit stop but still fifth. And in sixth place, Wes Cooley, Murray Ogilvy on 11, a Honda 900. Greg Pretty now been riding for one and a half hours the small South Australian both of his, you could say he's a production bike specialist but he's also a road race specialist on, on racing bikes because he really rides both with equal aplomb, a very hard and forceful rider. He was in third place for the last 69 laps but then with everybody else pitting all but of the major contenders for outright but the XS 1100 Yamahas, Pretty now in the lead and backed up more strongly probably than any other team in the race by Jim Budd going from the Avon team, recovering from severe head injuries here some months ago and uh, declared fully fit and really a very favoured team at this stage. Dunlop Loop and the exit from it sees Roger Hayes on bike number one. The third of three XS 1100 Yamahas which by virtue of no pit stops are now holding the first four three of the first four places in the race. Hayes, of course, has won the race twice previously and has a very interesting philosophy and race tactic for this year. Well, I think this year we've got a, a better chance than last year, um, mainly because we're lapping faster, because of the Honda's threat, 
Um, the riders are just trying a little bit harder to stay with the Hondas. So I think we've still got a good chance. Last year we could have gone all the way through without a tyre change, but it, we thought we were going to be pushed near the end of the race. So we wanted to put a new tyre on just so we could keep sprinting. The way it turned out, we could have, we just cruised home. But this year I'd say there'll be a lot more teams pushing us, so we'll do the same, we'll change again. The race leader, Greg Pretty of the South Australian, being partnered by Jim Budd, who's going to take the second stint on this bike, into the pits now, after one hour, 43 minutes of riding and 104 laps. He expected. he expected to be in almost 10 minutes ago. That's 10 extra laps he squeezed out of it. At the back of the bike, Frank Maddich, Pirelli importer in Australia, checking the depths of the tyres. At the next pit stop, they will have to make a tyre change. Maddich now checking it. Jim Budd, last year's winner on the bike, and he's out in 19 seconds, particularly fast compared to other stops so far in the race. Practices for this meeting is the first time that Jim Budd has been back racing on the Amaru Park circuit since about four months ago when he fell up here in the Dunlop Loop right in front of a very close friend of his, Neil Hay and uh, Neil Chivers and Chivers had nowhere to go and in fact hit Jim Budd in the head with his bike. He couldn't avoid him, he was dreadfully upset about it and uh, but there with his old teammate, Roger Hayes Looking like he's been working very hard. Greg Pretty, how's the track? It's the slipperiest it's been all week. I think the, I think the humidity of the day is bringing up all the oil that uh, everybody spilled during the week. And um, with so many bikes on the track at once, it's really taking its toll as far as uh, oil and, uh, um, well, petrol getting spilled as well. What about rider concentration? <sighs> Tends to get you a bit disorientated when you see a few guys crash in front of you, especially the ones that... Uh, you wouldn't expect to, uh, easy Ronnie Bolden and uh, Murray Hill especially, so uh, you've really got to keep your wits about you. You managed to get far more out of a tank full of petrol than perhaps you'd expect it. Uh, yeah, I think this is due to, uh, you know, being so slippery, we're, we're having to, uh, to close the throttle off a little bit earlier and of course uh, not using as much juice. And there's his co-rider, Jim Budd. Number one, the Yamaha 1100, now at the moment in third position, into the pits and Dave Robbins, co-rider on for his first stint. In and out, the time, 15 and a half seconds, and they're the sort of statistics that won the race for the Avon team last year. Roger Hayes in on the Yamaha, now in third position after a fairly slow start, Roger. Yes, well, it's very slippery out there, and um, I was expecting a few accidents. Um, we're just trying to conserve one pace all the way through the race, and we're hoping to be up there about, about the four-hour mark. A couple of the riders now have mentioned the state of the track. Is it going to get much worse? Well, at the moment, it's just like riding on ice. Um, if I wasn't worried about falling off, I could probably go faster, you know. But and yet you're still lapping pretty quickly. Yes, it's not too bad, but it's just, if you really try and stick it into it, um, you're just going sideways, and I'm not uh, prepared to risk that, you know. On the corner, the race leader, Neil Chivers, sharing the bike number six with Alan Hales, and 121 laps completed after two hours, one third race distance. So that indicates 363 laps over the uh, entire race distance. The previous race record was 356 laps done in 1977 by Joey Muir and Ken Blake on the BMW 1000. Last year, they actually covered two laps less. Uh, Roger Hayes and Jim Budd in winning the race on the Yamaha 1100. This is the relief rider, Neil Chivers, doing a grand job. He leads, as you can see on the pie scoreboard, uh, Graham Crosby on four and Akihiro Kiyohara, the Japanese who hasn't yet had a ride. In third place, the New Zealand pairing of David Hiscock and Peter Fleming. That's another of the Suzuki's, it's a Kawasaki in second place. Then the Yamaha, the best placed Yamaha, is fourth, Greg Pretty and Jim Budd, bike number 12. Fifth place, number two, Alan Decker and Dennis Neal, who were black flagged earlier for Dennis Neal's uh, careless riding on the CB900 Honda, the best placed of those bikes, and then Roger Hayes and David Robbins on yet another of the Yamahas. So that's the situation at one-third race distance. The last lap 
for Neil Chivers, the relief rider on that bike, 59.1 seconds, 118 kilometres an hour. So that's a very good time indeed. Behind the scenes of the Castrol 6 hour drama boils in the stewards room. Dennis Neal, you've been told you'll be charged over that incident with Ron Bolden. Yes, it looks like they've made a decision. Um, we've put in a counter protest against their decision. We want the time that we lost off the track um, given back to us. Uh, it was a fair dice. We're going into the corner. I'd, I'd followed Ron for a lap and sized up exactly where I could pass him. I had the inside line going into the corner and when Ron saw me next to him, he closed the gate. They're about to come in. One question. You have been accused of being pretty dodgy though, haven't you, as a rider? Yeah, well, uh, I think all riders get these accusations against them. My argument is, if I'm a dodgy rider, uh, why have I got such a good record of non-crashing? Like I set pole and I've been riding good this season. Uh, the only times I've fallen off is in the rain. So there's my argument. You face an extra pit stop because of your uh, problem this morning. Yes, we're running fifth at present. Um, a calculation looks like we're going to have to come in about three or four laps from the end just for a couple of points. But I'm going to go out there now and see if I can get some of the places back that we lost earlier. Decker's in, bike two. Dennis Neal getting on the motorcycle now. This has cost them the motor the Castrol six hour race, this extra pit stop that they're going to have to have later this afternoon. Neil aggressive, going out there now to ride his heart out. 15 seconds the pit stop. Right, coming now through the Dunlop loop, the all girl crew of uh, Debbie Brinkley and uh, Jenny Coates riding a, a GS750 Suzuki and lying in 30 seconds outright at the moment but they are of course contesting the 750 class more than anything else the interesting thing with this team more importantly though is that it is an entirely all-girl crew their team manager Diana Jones and their uh, chief mechanic is Sandra Peachy and uh, this, I think, would be the first time in the 10-year history that uh, we have had an all-girl team, that is, rider and mechanics as well, going very well. And uh, they are riding very smoothly at this stage as they now head up onto the main straight once again, chasing another of the 750-class machines, number 39, as they head now up over the top and into Dunlop Loop. Bike 14, the Yamaha 1100 of Ron Bolden that crashed in the loop when actually leading the race. And Stephen Gall, who's been riding it since Bolden fell off. Bolden's still undecided about getting into the saddle, although obviously not going to do so at the moment. The problem for the team is that Gall is not allowed by race regulation to ride more than four hours. Bolden's injured and doesn't feel like getting back into the saddle. So Gaul's gone out again. This is the second stop for the bike, apart from the laps they lost. And there were about seven of them when the bike was crashed up in the Dunlop Loop. So a fairly unhappy team. And of course involved in the protest and the controversy that affects Dennis Neal on bike number two. Bike eight, heading for Ron Hodgson Corner, the Suzuki GS1000. Alan Hales leads the race on a similar bike, and this bike's lying third, a New Zealand pairing, and we really do have a lot of top New Zealand riders in Australia going very well over here. Hiscock's only come over here recently, Peter Fleming's co-riding with him, and they are really riding very consistently. They were equal fifth in qualifying yesterday with a time of 58.3. They're running in the Dick Hunter team, and... Uh, they're really very well placed at this stage, but apparently planning a pit stop fairly shortly, which would seem to be a little bit early. But have a look at the style of David Hiscock around the circuit. He's been riding for the uh, Total Team Hunter group for a while, including on their 500 RG Suzuki race bike as well as doing production racing. Hasn't had an enormous amount of success. He's had a couple of falls, but uh, signalling to his pit there, acknowledging a signal. Ron Bolden, your motorcycle race is over? Yeah, well, this day, John, looks, um, it looks like it, you know. Stephen's out there. The bike having a bit of tyre trouble. We, to, we should have changed his tyre by now. That's what we we're planning on doing. Um, I don't feel 100%, but if there's any chance of us coming up there, well, I'll be back out there. What sort of injuries do you have, and how bad do they feel? I feel pretty bad, but um, I've just got a lot of skin off, off my leg and off my hands and that, but nothing broken or, you know, just, just twisting all that, which is just, you know, a bit of pain, but it's, um, it'll be all right. It's definitely dangerous to go in Mexico with a bike. Well, yeah, 
Yes, it is really. Um, you know, I'm not going to take any silly risks. If there's no possible hope of us doing any good, um, I'm not going to take the chance. And here with 143 laps completed comes the third place position bike at the moment. The New Zealand teaming of David Hiscock and Peter Fleming. Coming in, we believe, to change a tyre. And if so, it'll be the first tyre change in the race so far. And there they go, into the back wheel. And let's see how long it takes on a chain drive bike. The Yamahas with shaft drive are easier to change a wheel on. Everything ferociously hot around the rear. The disc brake, the exhaust pipes. Let's just see how long it takes. We saw the bike moving around a little bit just a few laps ago. One half of the job done. The disc brake pads kept open by a special clamp. Now into position, not going badly. Not going too badly at all, but nevertheless, a lot of time. The Yamahas can do it in 50 seconds. Now they're in trouble. It's not going in. They've done the easy half, this is the hard half. And when things don't go right, people start bashing. And <laughs> now a handful of bits. <laughs> this is interesting because this is where the Chief Scrutineer, Chris Peckham, said, no, you cannot glue together the various washers and so on if they're in separate bits. When the bike's new, that's the way they must remain, and you've got to put them all back bit by bit. That's the team, and they were in third place, 143 laps completed, when they started this stop. This cock onto the bike, Fleming off. The way they go. So that will have dropped them down considerably. They'll have dropped nearly two laps at just under a minute a lap. But David Hiscock in the saddle now, the number one rider on bike eight. Graham Crosby riding bike number four is now the race leader with the pit stop about two minutes ago for the Alan Hales Neil Chivers Suzuki number six. Due to hand over when he next pits to Kiyohara, the uh, Japanese co-rider, but round he goes for yet another lap with two and a half hours completed now by that bike. Acknowledges his pits and are coming in fairly certainly at the end of this lap. Crosby up the hill, hitting the lead in the race for the first time. A tenuous lead because he's due for a stop, but it's also a lead of only a few seconds over Hales, who slipped back only to second place with his second pit stop. Pretty in third place, but one pit stop less to do for him and Jim Budd on bike number 12. Fourth place, Dennis Neal, who's already had two stops. And fifth place, Roger Hayes and David Robbins on number one. But here comes Crosby. Will Kiyohara be as quick as Crosby on the bike? There are few motorcycle riders in the world as quick and as talented as Graham Crosby. In he goes. In behind Craig Blackburn and Glenn Fenton on 27. He slows, he pulls into pit lane and heads for what should be a very quick stop. The best place of the Z1R Mark II Kawasaki's, a bike that dominated the race for some years. Kawasaki's generally, and particularly the 900 Kawasaki's before. And let's watch. Is there a tyre problem? We've got an airline to the bike. Crosby doesn't appear to be getting it. Yes, he is now. There's a problem. Airline to the bike. Is he worried about a flat tyre or tyre wear? A slow stop of 29 seconds. A very slow one indeed. Kiyohara. Akihiro Kiyohara. Uh, a very experienced rider in Japan. He did motocross for a number of years and uh, in fact won the novice section of the Suzuka six-hour race back in 1967. He's a good rider. 
and in fact a Kawasaki development and test rider. Graham Crosby, you fought to the lead from 15th position in the Castrol 6 hour, but you've got a problem with the front tyre? Well, not really now. I think it's more psychological. I went out there and uh, I put a new, uh, I came in for fuel stuff, loaded the bike up with fuel and I think just the, the sheer weight of it changed the handling characteristics and automatic, automatically I thought, uh, tyre or something like that. Um, but it has changed a little bit but there'll be no problems at all I don't think. Do it's still got the right pressure and we started with and it's just a small uh, difference in handling, that's all it is. You didn't want to get off the motorcycle at that second stop then to hand over to Kiyohara? I wasn't going to. Why not? Oh, the second stop? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, you were well reluctant to get off the motorcycle. No, actually, to be quite honest, I forgot. Oh, we're not sort of that good a team, you know. Like we haven't, the riders can get out the track in here all round, but uh, as far as when they come into pits and what they're supposed to do, we always forget. Don't blame it on us. Cameron McMillan, assistant clerk of the course, has excluded Dennis Neal from the results. Why? Well, actually, John, that's not quite right. I haven't excluded Dennis Neal from the results. The stewards have held an inquiry into the incident, and the stewards of the meeting have excluded uh, Dennis Neal from the event. However, uh, they have a right to appeal to the ACU of New South Wales. That is, his team have a right to appeal to the ACU of New South Wales. They have lodged an appeal against the suspension or the exclusion, and that will now have to be heard by the ACU of New South Wales at a later date. Meanwhile, uh, Dennis Neal is riding in the event, um, I suppose, under a, under a protest or under uh, pending an inquiry. That's the bike, though, that's, uh, some might say, wasting its time. Bike number two, Dennis Neal now in the saddle. You heard him say earlier that uh, he was going up there going to try and pull back some of the placings that he'd lost by virtue of being black bagged and brought into the pits early. But that's the area too, the Dunlop Loop, where he and Ron Bolden, by the admission of both riders, certainly hit. There's no question of it having happened. The question is where the blame lies. But uh, it was up in the Dunlop Loop. Bolden came down. Cameron McMillan, the assistant clerk, of course, we were just listening to, would be very cautious. Look at that. Uh, O'Neill there working the bike hard and sliding it out of Honda Corner. But uh, Cameron McMillan would be very careful to uh, make sure that uh, he had no part in the decision to exclude Dennis Neal because McMillan is a business partner of Ron Bolden, the rider that was brought down by Dennis Neal. We've just seen an accident on from bike number four, the Japanese rider Akahiro Kiyahara, teammate of Graham Crosby, who did at one stage lead the race at present running in second position. They were in second position before that accident. He's dropped it at the bottom of Dunlop Loop. Kiyahara, the Japanese rider, who was having to chase the leaders with, uh, after Crosby had gone out and set a certain amount of speed in the lead, Kiyahara has had to go out and try to match the speed of Crosby, and maybe that has told in the end. Crosby's gone down. What's happening? Oh, I'll have to go and bring, bring the bike back. Well, Graham Crosby has heard the news that Kiyahara is down. He's not wasting any time. He's on with the leathers, and he's up. have to go now right round the circuit. It's almost, well, it would be two-thirds of this circuit at Amaru to get to the bike, and it, so, uh, it will have to uh, be waited to be seen as to whether or not that bike will be fit to continue with the race. But Crosby has run to the end of the pit lane here now. He'll have to pick up his helmet, of course, before he goes out. He's just checking to see how bad the damage is. Kawasaki, Z1R, Mark II, who were in second position. Well, Crosby has taken off across the circuit. It doesn't look like he's going to attempt to run around and pick up the bike. He certainly will have to come back if he does. He's crossed the circuit now to see what the situation is. So halfway in the Castrol six-hour race at Amaru, and the lap count, look at it, 183. Looking at the old lap record set in 1977 by Joey Smuir and Kenny Blake on the BMW, 356 completed laps, so they're in front of that lap record now by something like five laps at the halfway stage. Looking at the leading board, leaders board, we see Alan Hales and 
Neil Shivers on the Suzuki, bike number six leading from bike number two, Dennis Neal and Alan Decker, the Honda CB900, who were involved in that very vital dice earlier in the, in the uh, race with Ronnie Bolden, when Ron Bolden was forced out of the race, and Dennis Neal, Alan Decker team on the Honda, now having to face the stewards and a possibility of disqualification from the race, but racing on and holding second position at the moment. In third position, bike number 12, the Yamaha XS1100 of Greg Pretty and Jim Budd. They're the team, Jim Budd forcing the pace at the moment on the bike and in third position. In fourth position, bike number one, Roger Hayes and Dave Robbins, another Yamaha 1100. And it's an interesting dice at the moment with those two bikes in third and fourth position Remembering that Jim Budd last year won the race with Roger Hayes from the Avon team. This year, Jim Budd is teamed with Greg Pretty. And another Yamaha running third and fourth at the moment and looking very, very firm contenders for this year's Castrol. In fifth position at the moment, bike number nine, Len Attlee and Gary Coleman. And in sixth position, bike number eight, we see Dave Hiscoff and Peter Fleming, another Suzuki, a New Zealand team. Now, running through the 750 class, Ken Young. Yes, leading the 750 class, the 650 Kawasaki of Gardner and Pace, bike number 19. Running in second place, number 39, Brown and Gregor, also on a 650 Kawasaki. And in third place, Barry Smith and Chris Oldfield on an XS750 Yamaha. That's the position halfway through now, the Castrol six hours, the leaders board showing 185 laps. Gone no, it's not too bad. A couple of minutes and we'll have it uh, back on the road. It gives us a chance to do a tyre change now in the slowest possible time without making a mistake. You're always looking for the good parts, but surely it is the end of your Castrol six hours, isn't it? You always say that to me every bloody year. <laughs> No, no, we'll, we'll be right. We'll just have to tune the other rider up when he gets back. <laughs> now, can you ride the rest of the event by yourself, or do the regulations prevent you from doing it? Oh, I don't cloud the issue with vax at the moment, mate. <laughs> no, we'll be right. No, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I can do another uh, an hour and a half or something like that, which will give Kiyohara time to sort of uh, get going so he can do the rest. And there we see Jimmy Budd putting up the hand, the signal to pull into the pit as the Yamaha comes in for the second scheduled pit stop, fuel change and possibly a tyre change as well. Into the pits, Pretty, the co-rider, ready to jump into the saddle. Into the pits. Allegedly the fastest of the rear wheel changes, the Pitman's Yamaha from South Australia. Last year's winner, Jim Budd, off the bike now. Greg Pretty about to get on it, working at the rear of the bike. The Pittman brothers, Dean and Malcolm, working furiously. 15 seconds gone. Malcolm Pittman can't get the axle out. Yes, he can. It's gone. 22 seconds, and the rear, the rear tyre's off. New tyre going on. Greg Pretty mounting the bike even as the petrol goes into it. This is going to be a fast one. It could even win the Castrol six hour. The rear axle is about to go in. Slammed in. 40 seconds. Last year they did it in 1 minute 12 seconds. 45 seconds the bike started. So Greg Pretty, a very, very fast tyre change indeed. Jim Butter, fantastic pit stop, only 52 seconds. It gives you a great advantage. Well, I hope so. It's that slippery out there. We need Greg on a good tyre to sort of keep up the pace. Jim, four months ago you had a huge prang here. You hurt yourself very badly. There are a lot of people who said that you shouldn't be racing today. How do you feel in yourself? Well, it's not four o'clock. But you were running very hard out there against your former teammate, Roger Hayes. Well, that was very testing. I didn't want to cause any arguments between us, so I had to keep it very clean. But do you feel sharp yourself? I feel pretty sharp, but this heat starting to get to me. It's very hot. So 210 laps gone in the Castrol 6-hour 1979, and the race leader still the Suzuki 1000 of Alan Hales and Neil Shivers. They have a commanding lead at the moment. 
1 minute 44 seconds from the second place team of Dennis Neal and Alan Decker on the Honda CB900. But of course they're still facing the possibility of being suspended by the stewards. So Alan Hiles and Neil Shivers, who of course had a magnificent uh, stint in the race lead last year in the Castrol, showing them what they can do again this year. In fact, I think Will Hagen, it was about this stage of the race where Alan Hales and Neil Shivers took the race to the, uh, to the ultimate last year in the Castrol. Yes, they were well on towards two-thirds race distance when Alan, right here up in the Dunlop Loop, had got involved for a few laps in dicing with Roger Hayes, not realising that Hayes was some laps behind, and uh, came into the Dunlop Loop and just overcooked it. He was convinced that Hayes had uh, touched him, but when he saw it on film he realised that wasn't so and he'd made an error. And Alan Hayes now, 30 years of age, uh, is certainly contemplating retirement. And I put it to him that if he wins, would he retire? And he said, yes, probably he would. So, getting onto the bike now, Roger Hayes getting off it, David Robbins. And uh, the Yamaha attempt to run on two pit stops only was thwarted well back at their first pit stop because they didn't get to the two-hour mark. They fell short by about a quarter of an hour. But here's their tyre change. The team that last year revolutionised the approach to the Castrol 6R because the Pitman team doing the tyre change for them and the Avon team deciding, yes, we'll change it in a split instant decision uh, won them the race when they went out and on good rear rubber were able to run at very quick speeds for the remainder of the race. They did the change last year later on in the race but everybody now thinking that they might have run well run roughly each half of the race on fresh rubber and particularly as uh, all the riders are saying the track is so slippery. It's very hot, it's nearly 100 degrees here today and uh, around 115 degrees at track temperature so they need everything running for them. And there goes the man that won the race last year and in 76, Roger Hayes. And Will, it becomes an interesting question now as whether, uh, whether the whole tactics of the six hours is going to change from this year on. In they go. position, Wes comes in for his tyre change. Dunlop team working now very smoothly, in fact, as they swing the motorcycle up using a two-arm jack to get it up out into the air as Wes Cooley steps off and Murray Ogilvy slides into position. Fifteen seconds gone already. The rear axle's out and the tyres drop the chains off. Only 20 seconds gone. This is going to be a fast one. Ambient temperature is one thing, the track temperature is another. The track temperature, this hot mix surface, is getting above 40 degrees centigrade out there. It's taking a huge toll on tyres. This tyre has still got to do another two and a half hours in the Castrol 6 hour. Only 35 seconds gone, the axle's in place. This could be the fastest stop of the race. Down goes the bike, hits the, hits the starter button, and 44 point... With the chain drive, the Yamaha is being quick, quicker than anything else. But the chain drive Honda 900, the fastest so far for a rear wheel change. Where's Cooley? There's not much meat left on that tyre. No, that's for sure. It was uh, slipping around quite a bit out there. But uh, everything's going all right. We had an excellent tyre change. Uh, the guys have really worked hard on it. Dunlop's doing a real good job here. And, uh, I think we should be there in the end. Well, with only that much meat left on the tyre, can the new one do two and a half hours? Oh, yeah, no problem. There was quite a bit left after our second gas stop. Uh, it was kind of marginal as to whether it would go to the three, but it did. I just had to slow down the pace a little bit, so I think we'll be really good towards the end of the race. Bike number 19 into the pits, a Z650 Kawasaki, the leader since the flag dropped to start the race this morning in the 750 class. Gardner, told to go, the bike fires, they're out in just 12 seconds, that's the consistency that they've been doing for the last two pit stops, and that's the consistency that will almost certainly win them the 750cc class. So there we see the race leader after 232 laps of the Castrol, six hour gone for 1979, and it's Alan Hales on the Suzuki 1000. In fact, of the 232 laps already gone this year, two thirds of the way into the race, Alan Hales and Neil Shivers have taken 177 of them. That's of the 230 laps gone, they've led for 177 for this year's race, and that's an outstanding performance. Looking at their lead already in the race, two thirds gone, 2 minutes 40 seconds over the second place bike which is the Honda 900 CP ridden by Dennis Neal and Alan Decker.
Neil Shivers on the bike at the moment. The Suzuki with perhaps the victory signal number six on the front. Up the main straight, the right hand kink up the hill towards Bitchapave, flat out at maximum speed, go third and fourth placed bikes. In fact, second and third if you take out the Honda 900 of Dennis Neal, which is riding under protest, bike number two. This is second and third place are being held by bike eight, the Peter Fleming David Hiscock New Zealand entry, the Suzuki 1000, and nine, the Yamaha 1100 of Len Atley and Gary Coleman. Coleman riding at the moment. They are battling for race positions. There you have them. They're on the same lap, and that's second and third place in the Castrol 6R, and they have been riding for over four hours, and that's the distance between the two of them. With Alan Hales more than two laps in the lead, a tremendous scrap going on down at Rothman's corner. Look at the difference between the two bikes as they accelerate out of there. Len Atley, who won the race, the inaugural Castrol back in 1970, sharing a, a diminutive Triumph 650, diminutive by the standards of today's enormous, big-engined and powerful Japanese multi-cylinder monsters. But uh, back then it was a twin-cylinder Triumph 650 that won the race with the late Triumph people. Then in 74, Atley won again, sharing a Kawasaki 900 with Ken Blake. Both of these riders now, on this tremendously slippery track, are averaging about 118 kilometres an hour, 59.9 second lap times. With an hour and a half of the Castrol six hour left, it's all over for Graham Crosby. Graham, you've been caught by the, uh, the overtime rule. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm only allowed to do four hours and that's about it. I can't do any more. And the, the K-Rider's in a bit of a sorry state at the moment, so I'm afraid we'll just have to finish it there. How was the bike going after it was dropped? I think I picked up an extra thousand revs, but I think the taco cable might be bent and it's given, <laughs> given us a false reading. Yeah, how did it go around corners? It looks a bit bent. Uh, I went around right hand, uh, right, uh, left hand corner is really good, but there's only two left handers in it, but the right one is a bit dodgy. <laughs> well, you've tried again to win the Castrol six hour, and unfortunately, again, you've failed. How do you feel? You're asking me that? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Someone's got to win it, but I suppose it's going to be my turn sooner or later. Just fallen off. Taylor and Bundy uh, yeah. dragging the left muffler there on number 38 and uh, pulling up very wisely on the Z650 Kawasaki. What bad luck for them. They dropped the bike earlier today, I think, and uh, presumably have damaged the mountings, and finally it's um, come adrift. Up the top of the hill at the Dunlop Loop, and uh, that cloud of dirt announces that somebody's gone off in a big way. And uh, there he is, travelling marshal right to him. And this is the situation late in the day. The track is getting more and more slippery. And uh, riders, of course, are becoming very weary. And uh, the travelling marshal doing all he can to make the rider as comfortable as possible. And he certainly does look as though he's going to need ambulance attention. Out of Honda corner comes Alan Hale, the man who, with his co-rider Neil Chivers on the Suzuki 1000, has dominated this Castrol 6R. There have been five different race leaders, but he, coming in for his uh, final fuel stop, has led for 220 laps of the 295 now completed, just turning up 296. Coming in, going to hand over probably to Neil Chivers, to check his tyre. Does it need a change? The contentious pit stop. Neil Shivers in, Alan Hale's ready to get out. Frank Maddich has first look at the rear tyre. He says he's got one and a half millimetres. Will they, three and a half millimetres, will they change the rear tyre or won't they? If they change the rear tyre, their chance in the Castrol 6 might be gone. They say no tyre change, no tyre change, they're going to go. The scrutineer moves in to have a look at the rear tyre. He says it's OK too, and they're right to go. 30 seconds gone. It's a slow, slow pit stop. There seems to be some problem. They're filling, refilling the crankcase with oil. They put in a top-up of oil at the same stage. Castrolator going into the bike. 
and out goes Alan Hales of 47 seconds, but he saved himself. No tyre change. He's now got to get through the next one hour, five minutes with his original rear tyre. That is the situation after exactly five hours of furious racing here in the Castrol 6R. There are 29 bikes still running and the leader remains Alan Hales despite his last pit stop with a lead of more than two laps over Dennis Neal running under protest and at this stage is qualified on bike two. Greg Pretty on the Yamaha number 12 is third. Then fourth is number nine. That's Len Attlee on the 1100 Yamaha. There's 300 laps and that indicates that we'll have a race record this year beating the previous race record of Joe Eastmuir and Ken Blake 256 laps by about four laps when the race finishes in 60 minutes time. Alan Hales the race leader comfortably now into his last stint. The bike's been going 1 hour 13 to 1 hour 14 minutes on a tank. He's only got to do 65 minutes on this tank. And uh, with the lead rider in the saddle, there he is, Alan Hales, the 30-year-old motorcycle dealer manager, uh, will realise his ambition to win the Castrol 6R and to put Suzuki in the winner's circle for the first time. With less than an hour remaining, Alan Hales is leading the race, still on his original tyre. Can it last the distance? Frank Matic is the Australian importer of Pirelli tyres and a former Australian racing car champion. Frank, you looked at the tyre. Can it go the distance? It's got, uh, John, it's got three and a half mil on it at the moment. That's a fraction uh, better than half worn, so it's in good shape. They say that the minimum uh, allowed is one millimetre. Correct. Will it get down to one millimetre at the end? No, it's, uh, no, it'll get down to about two and three quarter. How, how, how does that tyre manage to get through when so many other people are changing? Well, the 17-inch tyres on the Yamahas, they've got a change in Pirelli, but none of the 18-inch tyres have got a change, such as the other Kamasakis and that. But on a hot day like this, why? Well, I was a little bit worried about today being so hot because we've not been able to test in this temperature, but the tyre is standing up just as well as it was during the week. We had a look at another tyre that was almost fully worn at three hours. Which, which was that? It was the West Cooley tyre. Oh, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I, I've not been working with them, so I don't really know. But... There's two ways to approach it. We've been pretty lucky. Our, our, in, during our testing and that, we've been able to come up with a tyre that has got a tr tremendous profile. It's not stressing the case in any one area. And we're, therefore our wear is getting spread uniformly around over the tyre. And as such, we're just going down evenly, generally across the face. If, if anyone does push Hales towards the end, has he got enough meat on his tyre to be able to oh, raise yeah. the challenge? Oh, yes. No trouble at all. Only one thing, uh, we do like to keep the tyres fresh. The longer you use the tyre, they do tend to harden a bit and cure up a bit. So his road holding wouldn't be as good as it would be on a new tyre. And I suppose that he would lose about 0.3 or 4 of a second at the moment if he had to go maximum. But as he doesn't, there's no point in changing it. Frank Manich, thank you. Thanks, John. Frank? Well, after, uh... Dennis Neal there on bike number two. The contentious bike in the race at this stage. He's running second on the leaderboard, but he's riding under protest because early in the day he uh, collided with Ron Bolden. Bolden appealed to the stewards and said it was dangerous riding. He shot me off my bike. The stewards heard the evidence and decided, with evidence from travelling marshals and corner marshals, that Dennis Neal had ridden dangerously. They disqualified him. That's most contentious. Some of the organising club officials feel very strongly about it, but at the moment he is placed second, although under this uh, threat, under appeal in fact, because he has been disqualified. Behind him is the big XS 1100 Yamaha, bike number 12, from South Australia, the Pittman's Yamaha of Greg Pretty and former race winner Jim Budd. Boy, that takes a lot of skill for somebody to control that big bucking Yamaha at that sort of speed up around the 120 kilometres an hour through Ron Hodgson corner and Greg Pretty just the man with the skill and the daring to have a crack at it and not to back off one bit through the Dunlop loop. This man has a lot of skill and has won a number of the major production races in Australia in the Australian calendar in Perth the 3R, in Adelaide the 2R and uh, being a top racer, he doesn't know how nor wants to back off. 
watching under brakes and see how stable it is. And then Ron Hodgson corner again, where he wiggled previously. And then in third, fourth, fourth, fourth place behind him, third place subject to that disqualification is Glenn Ashley, the veteran that won the race in 1970 when it was first held, and then backed up again in 1974, sharing the bike with Gary Coleman, doing a grand job. They worked their way unobtrusively into the leaderboard and now are running fourth and perhaps third, depending on Dennis Neal's situation. And that's Glenn Atley in the saddle, 36 years old. Into Rothman's corner. And then behind him, Glenn Atley was having a duel earlier on with this New Zealand team that had been up very high. David Hiscock and Peter Fleming on the Suzuki Thousand, the same sort of bike as being ridden by the race leader at this stage, Alan Hales. Uh, they're in fifth place at the moment, fourth subject to Dennis Neal's disqualification. Down to Honda Corner. And then, in sixth place behind them, is yet another of the XS 1100 Yamahas. Sorry, it's not one of those at all, it's the CB900 Honda, being ridden by the American Wes Cooley. Wes came back here, very hopeful, of uh, doing better than he'd done last year. He had an unhappy 6R, but at the moment he's in fifth place and perhaps sixth if Dennis Neal's disqualification is successful. But, uh, he goes to Honda Corner. There are dramas in other parts of the track. Greg Pretty, you've worked the big Yamaha up into third position, you've got less than an hour to go, is there anything you can do to improve on that? No, I think the tyres are uh, just a little bit beyond uh, pushing what we're doing now, so uh, all we can hope is uh, that the guys who are in front of us and uh, have alluded to do a tyre change, um, their tyres will be slippery enough to um, slow them down so we can catch up. What instructions has Jim Budman given? Uh, that the tyre is okay, it is a lot better this time than uh, the first pit stop, so uh, he's just go for broke at the moment as best he can. What sort of times does that mean? Can we expect to see him in 59s at this time of the day? I should hope so without any problem, yeah. What have you been doing? I believe 59 around that mark. Does it feel good doing that or is it slippery? You've got to push it, it is a bit slippery, but uh, it's definitely not uh, way beyond any limit or anything like that. It's okay. Thanks for putting Roger Hayes has won the race twice previously, sharing the ride this year with David Robbins on bike number one, the Team Avon entry. And in fact, the entrant uh, is part of the race story of the Castrol 6R every year, because being the premier race for production motorcycles, it's also an enormous battle between the trade. And Avon tyres, made in England, have uh, had the greatest success of anybody in the race, but this year we've seen an enormous challenge come from Frank Matic, the importer of Pirelli, and he at the moment leads, equipping the Alan Hale Suzuki. But this is the Avon entry, Roger Hayes, and uh, he's in seventh place on the leaderboard. outright or if you discount Dennis Neal, 7th and leading the 750 class absolutely since the Le Mans start this morning is bike number 19, the Wayne Gardner John Pace Z650 Kawasaki. That's John Pace in the saddle and he holds the outright lap record here at Amaru Park. He's been around here on his 350 Yamaha race bike in 54 and a half seconds averaging 128 kilometres an hour. Nobody has been around Amaru Park faster than that on two wheels. He's 20 years old, brim full of ability and uh, a very nice, modest, quietly spoken young man and uh, sharing the ride with Wayne Gardner, a very talented rider recently, or a year or so ago, brought up to B grade, they have done superbly and have dominated the 750cc class, but also now are up into a very respectable placing outright. Behind him is number 39. 
This is the Brown Bobby Gregor entry, again a 750 class entry, and again a Kawasaki 650, and they're immediately behind the John Pace bike. Kawasaki 650 was picked a couple of years ago by Alan Hales and others as a potential outright winning bike. But that went wrong and uh, it came in third finally. But uh, it was never able to counter the slightly greater power of the big bikes despite its very good handling and remarkable power output for only 650 cc's. Four cylinder bike. in behind them is 21. Barry Smith and Chris Oldfield. Again, a 750 class bike, a Yamaha XS 750, a shaft drive bike. This is being ridden by, as I said, the lead rider, Barry Smith. Barry Smith is a veteran Australian rider who this year at Isle of Man uh, won the Formula 3 race in a widely acc acclaimed ride. He is a man of enormous talent. He won that about 10 years after having won the same event at Isle of Man. Uh, a man of great talent, but uh, with a name Barry Smith becomes a bit uh, easy to forget. And in behind them is number 30, Robert Morehouse, Peter Walker. You can see it in the middle of the bunch there. Peter Walker was a chap who shot to A-grade status on the outside of the bunch there. Shot to A-grade pretty quickly. Uh, but hasn't done an enormous amount since then in A-grade. He had a tremendously successful ride, or series of rides, at Bathurst as a B-grader more than a year ago, uh, two Easters ago. But um, hasn't done an enormous amount, but Rob Morehouse runs a, a 750 Yamaha race bike, and together they've been quite an effective combination. But the man that they'd all like to be able to pin back with such a comfortable lead of more than two laps is Alan Hales on bike number six, running this uh, new tyre, the Pirelli Phantom. It's been tested in the wet, and although it has very little tread, it's a remarkably good wet weather tyre. In fact, in England, they advertise it as a semi-slick racing tyre. There, incidentally, was Ken Blake reaching for the fuel tap on bike number five, just behind Alan Hales, and it could be that Ken Blake's planning to call into the pits in just a moment. Uh, but the uh, Pirelli Phantom overseas is advertised as a, as a semi-slick type tyre, although it's certainly, without any question, a road-going tyre. And uh, that's what's on the Alan Hales bike number six. In the hardest, fastest and hottest Castro Isle Six Hour ever, it's a job for the toughest of men to handle the pace out there. Jenny Coates is lying fifth in class. She's a lady rider on a Suzuki GS750. Jenny, what sort of concession are the blokes making to you on the track? Um, none whatsoever. None. Uh, we're all out there to race and win and there's just no quarter given. <laughs> Had you expected to be going as fast as you are? Ah, uh, yes, yes. It's, it's pretty hard. We knew we'd be going fast. Actually, the guys are going very hard. Um, we're probably going harder than what we thought we would, but we're just really out there to finish. We're not going to pull any desperates. <laughs> Have you had any moments on the track to date? Um, yes, quite a few. <laughs> Talk to me about one of them. Oh, just getting a bit out of shape, just by getting tired. You just sort of be a bit offline. You put the bike down and it sort of ground a bit on the pegs and then it'd grind harder and lift the back wheel and jump out again and just lots of moments like that because it's really tiring. What happens immediately after a moment like that? Do you stop and get yourself sorted out? No, you just gas it and, and say thank god I didn't fall off. <laughs> Jenny Gates, thanks very much indeed and best of luck. Thanks very much. An unusual way to spend a weekend for an intensive care nurse, which is what Jenny Coates is. And we look at bike 41, Fian and Pete, who've had a miserable day. They uh, broke the front number there on their 750 class bike earlier in the day in an accident at Rothman's Corner. And now, for the second time today, are pushing back to the pits. Travelling Marshall behind them seeing them safely into the pit area. And then we look at bike 17, Paul Cawthorn and Len Willing. They qualified fifth in the 750 class, a Kawasaki 650, and uh, probably an appropriate time to send best wishes to Len's older brother, Warren, who's uh, 
hospitalised in Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney, still being treated and recovering from the very bad injuries, very badly broken leg that he suffered in a freak accident which was none of his fault in Ireland a while ago. And uh, near him in hospital too is Owen Hughes who should have been sharing the ride with uh, Wes Cooley on the Honda 900. But uh, Len Willing and Cawthorn shared the bike last year. They came to grief during the race last year. And that is, in fact, Paul Cawthorn in the saddle at the moment. Dennis Neal again, the big man who um, charges very hard indeed and it was that hard charging, some call it 11 tenths riding, something a bit over the limit that got him into this uh, argument with officials which has seen him disqualified and seen, seen him appeal against that disqualification. But uh, some say if you're a racer of course you go hard, others say Dennis Neal rides too hard and uh, sometimes intimidates or even has been known to touch other bikes with uh, nasty consequences. Whatever, a very skilled rider, the holder of the outright production record here at Amaru Park at 57.6 and he was just a tenth of a second outside that when he qualified for pole position yesterday. Look at him, he's a big man but he gets down low on that Honda and look at the aplomb with which he throws it around. It's a very powerful bike. Develops maximum power at 9,000 revs, but maximum torque up very high at 8,000 revs. And so it's a very peaky power bike. And uh, it'll do nearly 225 kilometers an hour. Certainly 220 in fifth gear, somewhere around 90 in first, 120 in second, 160 or 100 miles an hour in third gear, with two to go. Diminutive Ken Blake. Nobody has won as many Castrol six hours, nor gone had such a good race record throughout all the years in which he's competed. It's unbelievable. Ken Blake has never done worse than fourth place until this year in seven starts in the Castrol six hour. He's had three victories, two second places, a third and a fourth. But this year the team's had its problems, of course, with yesterday a test bike, an old and hard walk work one, locking up, throwing the lead rider off at Tony Hatton. And they had to bring in a very talented rider, John Warrion, but as he said, not geared up to riding, not having done the days of preparation beforehand. And uh, that's just put them at a disadvantage. Consequently, they're running just a little way down in the field and a touch off the pace. And there's the leaderboard, 322 laps completed, showing Alan Hale still in the lead. From Alan Decker on two, at uh, 12 is of course Greg Pretty, Jim Budd, then Len Attlee on nine, the New Zealand teaming of Hiscock and Fleming on eight, and then the Wes Cooley, the American, and Murray Ogilvy on 11, the Honda 900. The 750 class you can see further over, and that's got bike 19 still in the lead, as it always has been, the uh, Wayne Gardner, John Pace, 650 Kawasaki. Board, but that's not counting Dennis Neal and uh, he's put in a great performance a professional motorcycle rider American superbike champion he rode with great heart and with uh, enormous skill at Bathurst in the rain when he'd never ridden in the rain before and he raced and he raced hard 
because in America they just <laughs> don't race in the rain. They they postpone car and bike races over there if it uh, starts to rain. But he had the situation. He'd been brought out to ride. And he was paid to be there. And Wes Cooley kept with it. And he did a grand job. And he was very keen to come back this year and try and improve on his unhappy performance in last year's 6R. They blew an engine in practices and then his co-rider Stephen Klein dropped it during the race and uh, Cooley was hopeful of doing better but nothing to be ashamed of to be in fifth place. CB900 Honda. The further misfortunes of course which befell the team were that uh, Glenn McQuarrie, a very talented up and coming rider, was to have been his co-rider but was killed in a car accident. He was replaced by Owen Hughes who one week ago in testing lost the bike on under brakes on the approach to Honda Corner, absolutely somersaulted it, wrote it off and put himself in hospital with a, a fractured leg and arm and of course he's in Royal North Shore in Sydney apparently about two beds removed from Warren Willing, so he'll be pleased to see the bike going well, even if he'll be some time before he's fully fit He was replaced in the team by Murray Ogilvy, and Ogilvy's done all that's been asked of him qualified in the fastest with a time of 58.4 here's 14 this man uh, very rarely races on the road Stephen Gall but he was Mr Motocross champion in 1978 he rides for the Pepsi team as does Ron Bolden but he rides on dirt for them He's won short circuit and motocross titles. He rode in the Castrol last year, but uh, like Cooley, wasn't happy with the way things went and was keen to come back and widen his experience and improve on his placing. And of course, that was the bike that was involved in the nudge with Dennis Neal and which uh, crashed early on, when in the lead, up in the Dunlop Loop. And uh, it's only just recently that Gaul has come back out onto the circuit because he's not allowed to exceed four hours at the helm and uh, Ron Bolden is not fit enough to ride and so now he's just riding to the finish uh, to be qualified as a finisher and within his four hour limit. We might ask him a little later on I said we can't get an answer for that. 326 laps down and the leaderboard reads number 6, second number 2. New, New Zealanders like uh, like uh, Graham Crosby and Stuart Bond and so many people in the field uh, are to be seen everywhere in Australian motorcycle racing and Murray Hill on this Yamaha XS 750 number 35 is in the 750 class. They qualified fourth fastest. Michael Cork is his co-rider. And they're a little bit way down in the, the field, but nevertheless running reliably. One of the 29 bikes still running of the 39 that started the Castrol 6 hour at 10 o'clock this morning. And there is just 33 minutes, 32 and a half to be exact, remaining in this year's Castrol 6 hour. Blackburn, sometimes known as Jumbo because he uh, his normal racing number is 747 uh, but uh, sharing the Honda 900 with Glenn Fenton actually was a fair way down in qualifying he was 18th fastest in yesterday's official qualifying but funnily that's not as bad as it sounds his time was 59.3 seconds and remember that the top 36 qualifiers all but the tail end three were separated in qualifying by only four seconds covered the 36 top riders in the field so no disgrace to be in the middle of that field with a time of 59.3 just 1.6 of the pole winning time Made us a fairly good offer. Um, but Having his own little dice there and enjoying himself 
Craig Blackburn, Glenn Fenton too, sharing the bike with him, a 900 Honda, a bike which uh, started off probably as favourite for the Castrol 6R, but which hasn't lived up to that because we see Suzuki 1000 and Yamaha 1100 dominating the leaderboard. Number 10, there's always somebody, he's leading this bunch of three, there's always somebody who has to have the first hard luck story of any race, and this is the bike, because Gary Thomas, on about the third lap of the race this morning, had had trouble with the back wheel locking, and uh, finally was spat off the bike down at Rothman's Corner. And in fact, Bob Levy, the team manager, uh, claimed that somebody had tampered with the bike and adjusted the brake up because they'd done an enormous amount of running and was certain that the bike was fit and properly adjusted. He's been sharing it with Clive Knight, who won the race some years ago. Thirty minutes and counting, and after four Castrol six-hour failures, Graham Crosby's going to go out and do the last half hour. Graham, why bother? Is it four or is it five? I don't know. I keep losing, losing track. Um, well, the whole idea is, you know, you've got to be in for the start and you've got to be in for the finish. You know, whether you do any riding between it, you know. Um, I will have to go out and finish anyway. You're restricted to only four hours riding. Your co-riders in hospital at this stage. The bike's battered. It must be pretty disappointing. I think it'd be very disappointing, but at least he might be sitting up in hospital watching us finish. That's going to at least make him feel a bit better, I suppose. Ross, what's your attitude going to be when you go out there? There's still a lap record that can be broken, I suppose. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, I don't think I'll be going for that. I think I'll just go for the finish, just cruise around. At this stage, the bike's still a little bit bent, but uh, it should be all right. I won't be going sort of super quick, we're just going to be there for the finish. Right, if, if, if I go too quick, you know, like it means just, just means doing too many laps, doesn't it? And you wouldn't want to get up there in the prize money, would you? Oh, no, 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 I don't want to, definitely don't want to get up in the prize money after I've had so, so long on the pitch, you know. Graham Crosby, Master Showman, thanks very much indeed. A real character but enormous of <laughs> As Crosby said, they reckon the first time he ever came to a circuit in Australia, as he wheeled his way out of the marshalling area and towards the track, he said, righto, which direction does it go and what's the lap record? Uh, a real character, but equally, what a talent. Went to Isle of Man this year and set the second fastest time that has ever been done at Isle of Man by a novice and the Isle of Man has claimed over the lives of more than 90 riders it is a treacherous mountainous circuit of some 37 miles and Crosby adapted to that like a fish in water he was averaging 175 kilometers an hour around Isle of Man and uh, Crosby can handle a motorbike like most of us can handle a piece of toast think of Graham Crosby. Cros, as he's known among the riders and very highly regarded for his ability, but also a man you can trust when he's in the saddle because they know his ability and they know too that he won't pull any stunts. Although a few years ago he was, a few claimed that uh, he was noted to to be able to kick you a bit, if, kick your bike if he was alongside it, but uh, none of that these days. And uh, Crosby has the offer and the possibility of going to Europe to contest the Formula One and World 500cc title races there next year. Right out near the fence, getting into the groove is Graham Crosby through Ron Hodgson's corner and just have a look at the smoothness and the ability of the man at the, at the handlebars. A crooked bike, as he said, it's beautiful through left-hand corners, but it's lousy through right-handers. But uh, look at the, the way that he's throwing it around the circuit. The rear brakes got run out, it's not in plumb. And uh, rear brake probably therefore not working very well, nor very evenly. But. Uh, that's nothing to this enormously talented man. The 
real Stan King. It was announced earlier this year that Crosby had hopes of trying to get into the Guinness Book of Records by doing a world record for a wheel stand at 190 kilometres an hour and that he was going to tackle that at Oran Park. bike number 12 and it is uh, Len Athley on number 9 chasing him look at Len Athley down inside bud can he hold on to it will he slide wide the answer is yes but he still hangs on to it 36 years old Len Athley 27 year old super sportsman Jim Bud they've been on the track for five and a half hours and they're at it hammer and tongs not letting up a bit but goes through Atley comes inside him and they charge off up, off up the hill they're on identical bikes XS 1100 Yamaha the heaviest bikes in the race 256 kilograms of motorcycle big 1100 cc four-cylinder bikes up in the Dunlop loop one week ago, Len Atley was in the Dunlop loop. He came across, he was doing some tyre testing, came across a very much slower bike, ran up the back of it, was going so slowly, absolutely wrote off his bike, and uh, slid down the tarmac himself at something around 140 odd kilometres an hour. And uh, last Thursday, he said, Oh, gee, I'm feeling sore. But uh, there was no question that Len Atley was going to ride, and look at how he's riding. Jim Bud pulling just a little bit of a break on him. Down to Rothman's corner. They'll be spearing their way through the traffic. Bud, the man that was uh, seriously injured here four months ago, serious head injuries, hospitalised and people very worried about him. And uh, he was dead keen to ride the six hour. Nobody thought it was on, including his previous sponsor, Lindsay Walker, for the manager of the Avon team. And that's why he's not riding for the Avon team. Lindsay thought it wasn't right, but he got the medical clearance required. He's since been second in a ski race, and uh, which is one of his other loves and a sport in which he's most accomplished, snow skiing. And uh, now well and truly informed in motorcycle racing. There's Bike 8. He's following immediately behind the Len Atley Jim Bud dice between numbers uh, 12 and 9. Next place is this New Zealand teaming of David Hiscock and Peter Fleming. Suzuki 1000 running for the Dick Hunter total team. And uh, they got together very effectively in the, in the race last year and came second in the 750cc class after crashing the bike badly during practices. This year just not able to keep up with the pace and the uh, the race strategy of the Alan Hales, Neil Chivers, Suzuki team, but nevertheless running very well. And you can see them coming up there on Ken Blake on the Honda number five. Up the hill he goes on the, uh, the big thousand Suzuki. And up at Dunlop we see Ken Blake on bike number five, the 900 Honda. Down on capacity with the Honda 6, which was a, a favoured bike last year, uh, and also the Suzuki 1000 and the Yamaha 1100. But light and uh, optimum power output coming from that bike. Very peaky and 
not at all an ideal road bike, but nevertheless it's sold on the road and it's selling very well at around $3,300. But uh, it has been very much the bike to beat in Australian production racing. It's not that it's never been beaten since it was introduced earlier this year, but it uh, usually has been the pace setter, but uh, not so in this Castrol 6R. And uh, we've seen domination by other vehicles. Ken Blake looking back just to see where everybody is. Up the top of the hill again. of uh, riders but it's a tyre war too and this is the Team Avon entry Roger Hayes and David Robbins who've been engaged in hefty battle throughout this uh, event because Yokohama, Continental, Dunlop and Metzola have all been in there struggling for honours but it looks to be Pirelli's year their first year at the 6R and it looks as though the previous top tyre of the 6R has been deposed the Avon, but uh, Roger Hayes, as you can see, still riding so hard. And it's that sort of form that took him to two victories in 1976 and then again in 1978. And in fact, yes, it's. Uh, Dave Robbins riding there in place of Roger Hayes. Roger's done uh, the major part of the riding on that bike, but it is his relief rider, David Robbins, riding at the moment. 59 seconds, their best time in qualifying. now running fifth, David Robbins, and uh, take out Dennis Neal, and that means he's running fourth. He's just got past the New Zealand team of Hiscock and Fleming on number eight. And then number two, Dennis Neal, the contentious uh, incident and entry in the race. That uh, early race clash between him and Ron Bolden means that firstly Dennis Neal's going to solve the situation on the track and then later he's going to have his hands full of an appeal against the ruling of the stewards here at Amaru Park which says you're disqualified for dangerous riding. This is where the incident happened where he and Ron Bolden's Yamaha touched and Bolden went down, hurt himself and of course lost a lot of time with their damage to the bike. Dennis Neal was sharing the ride with Alan Decker and uh, they were equal top qualifier. They took pole because they were the first to set the fastest time of 57.7. And he's riding like a man that holds the production and improved production lap record here at Amaru Park, who knows his way around here and can get a production bike around here quicker than any other rider. and hold the corner and the run out there and that kick which shows you just how accentuated it is and how a rider has got to be spot on not to run either wide onto the grass in the apex of the kick and you see Dennis Neal spearing down there past other riders you wouldn't know that at the moment he officially doesn't feature in the results at all would you absolutely flying 
and that's uh, bike number eight, the New Zealand pair that have just been overtaken by the Roger Hayes David Roberts Yamaha number one. Down upon the corner, we see him and powering his way out, and uh, this. Suzuki 1000 is one of the enormous number of Japanese bikes that have dominated this year's race because of the 39 starters in the event, Honda had 13 and the CB900 Honda was the most popular bike with 10 starters. Yamaha had 9 with 7 of the big XS1100s. There were 9 Kawasaki's, mostly made up of 5 650 Kawasaki's and then 5 Suzuki's, 4 of these GS1000s of which they're running first and fifth officially at the moment and there was just a lone Ducati Dharma which has run into trouble, a Triumph 750 which is still circulating and a lone BMW R100S which also ran into trouble early on. So, the least popular make of all the Japanese bikes in the event, Suzuki with only five entries as opposed to nine Kawasaki and Yamaha and 13 Honda but it doesn't matter how many you've got entered if you come in first. Suzuki's never won the race until now. They have been prominent in class wins but uh, this looks to be their year although that's not the particular bike that's leading that of course is Alan Hales on six. 15 minutes and counting, the tension in the pits is probably worse than that on the circuit. Neil Shivers, your co-rider with Alan Hales in the lead bike, how do you feel standing here? Well, I'm a little bit nervous at this stage, only having 15 minutes to go, having everything goes all right, but I'm pretty sure the reliability of the Suzuki uh, GS1000 that, uh, and, the, and capable hands of Alan Hales that uh, we should end up with a, a fine victory. Alan's come so close in the past and never quite done it. Uh, with maybe 14 laps remaining, the tension must be right on. And well, it is. Yeah, you, you're dead right, John. It's, uh, it's probably the longest 14 minutes of your life. So <laughs> hoping to get one big one and, and as being the biggest event we've got in Australia. He's lapping consistently in the 60-second mark at this stage. Do you think perhaps he's going a little slow? No, no, the, the, uh, we've planned it now with, with the, the lead that we feel we have, that 60 second uh, laps are adequate so that we finish with, uh, in a, with a margin of safety. When you got off the bike, did you leave him with any problems? No, there's no problems. The, the Suzuki 1000 is running absolutely beautiful and just to take it easy and look after yourself. <laughs> what sort of things would he be hearing out there right now? Would he be... Well, he has given us a few signals. I think that uh, lapping uh, at the slower pace that he is now, that it's tending to uh, drag on and he's thinking about other things rather than the job. When you're right on the ball at 10 tenths, well, you've got nothing else to think of, think of but getting around that circuit. But when you knock it off a little bit, you tend to wander. Well, that's a bit dicey, isn't it? Well, it is dicey, yeah, uh, but uh, there's not much you can do about it. It's, it's probably better than going 10 tenths and having that uh, chance of throwing the bike away. Well, in fact, you, you disappeared for the last quarter of an hour. We couldn't find you. Where were you? Well, uh, I slipped and had a quiet ale. <laughs> Already? <laughs> yeah. Right. Just to relax a little bit. It's a bit early to say congratulations yet, but we've got your fingers crossed for you for the next quarter of an hour. OK, good. Thanks very much, John. That's the other half of the team, Alan Hales, who in the Dunlop Loop last year with a big lead, bigger than his present lead of one minute 28 seconds, in other words about a lap and a half, uh, made an error about two thirds of the way into the race and dropped the model, dicing with a lapped rider, or a rider that was down a couple of laps to him. But now his lead, about a lap and a half over Dennis Neal, who's uh, presently disqualified, and a further lap and a half to second or third place, however you like it, uh, Yamaha 1100 of Greg Pretty and Jim Budd, only a bike length further back to bike number nine, Len Attlee and Gary Coleman, and about half a lap further back to number one, Roger Hayes and David Roberts on the Kawasaki. But what a, a grand job being done by Alan Hales, the 30-year-old motorcycle dealer from Brookvale in Sydney. Alan seriously contemplating retirement, I would say, after this win, and providing he wins, it's up to him because uh, if he just keeps it together, 
then victory is his. But uh, certainly he said that uh, it's in his mind and it certainly would have been in his mind if he were to win this weekend. Well, that looks to be his reward for a well-run weekend and an intense attack on the Castrol 6R with no errors as opposed to the uh, a one slip that he made last year when just as well placed as he is here today. A number of overseas riders, Wes Cooley doing the best of them from the United States of America. The other one notable was Akihiro Kiyohara, who was sharing bike number four with Graham Crosby, but who had a big fall and is now receiving hospital attention. Uh, we understand he's okay, but he did need attention. He'd ha had a blackout for a couple of minutes in the pits sometime later, and it was thought wise that he uh, he go into hospital care. And of course, riders from other states, a lot from New Zealand, a uh, so couple of Tasmanian teams and West Australians, but. Greg Pretty and Jim Budd are running second in the race. The South Australian Pretty, who was so well placed in the race last year when his co-rider Jeff Miller dropped the bike out of Mazda Corner. And uh, Jim Budd, the man who many thought either shouldn't ride or wouldn't be able to get a medical clearance to ride, but who's done both those things. And uh, he's in the saddle at the moment. And that's certainly not the speed of a man that's got anything wrong with him. His reflexes are top-notch, his skills as good as it ever was. And uh, Jim Budd reveling in being back to the competitive sports at which he's so good. Skiing, motorcycle racing, and so on. He works shift work in a colliery so he can pursue his sporting interests to their full extent. Up the top. Jim Budd, four months ago, off there, hit by Neil Chivers on another motorcycle that couldn't avoid him, and uh, seriously injured. Number nine in third place behind Budd is not very far behind him as they come down the track towards Honda Corner, Mazda Corner, and there he is. That is Len Attlee and Gary Coleman. Len Attlee not lining up for his third win. He won the race in 1970 and in 74. But uh, this year, third at the moment. Gary Coleman will be very pleased with this result. Gary had a good run at Bathurst, winning the 125 and 350cc races. He had a bad crash, Gary Coleman. Uh, Lynn Attlee we're watching at the moment, the older of the two riders. But uh, Coleman had a bad crash earlier this year in the first round of the Australian Championships in Tasmania on his 750 Yamaha racer. But he recovered well from that. The bike was very badly uh, knocked about. The first round last February, where he was chasing Graham Crosby and Ron Bolden. But uh, he's uh, done a great job on bike number nine with Len Attlee, and Len Attlee too, 36-year-old who always bucks at being called a veteran, but he is a veteran by virtue of his experience, the enormous number of wins he's had. He's won every Australian title at some stage except the 350. So Len's ridden the big ones and he's ridden the small ones, and he's a big, pretty big solid guy in himself. But he's done a grand job. And look at David Robbins crouching enthusiastically and energetically over the handlebars of bike number one, just as the lead rider does, Roger Hayes. Yamaha 1100, the hope of the Avon team for victory, but it wasn't to be. They've come into the leaderboard now, being shown as fifth, actually fourth, if you take out Dennis Neal. And... Uh, a satisfying result, but uh, to the arch-competitive rider, you see Wes Cooley not far in front of him on the all-yellow bike, number 11. To the arch-competitive rider, not good enough, because for them, first is the only position. Cooley going through there. And uh, in behind bike number 10, the Gary Thomas bike that was first down earlier in the day is number 17 from the 750 class, the Paul Cawthorn Len Willing bike. Further back in the 750 class, Paul Cawthorn riding, Len Willing, younger brother of Warren Willing, a very famous and well-known Australian international racer. 
he broke a collarbone earlier this year. Len campaigning over in uh, Europe, but he's gained valuable experience over there. Paul Cawthorne has specialised in this type of racing and has had a, a class win in the Castrol some years ago. And uh, they've done quite well today, but not quite been able to match the furious pace of John Pace on number 19 and Wayne Gardner, the leaders in the 750 class. Look at him, that's just a 650cc bike going up the hill, chasing the uh, Yamaha 1100 of Robert Morehouse and Peter Walker, number 30. Well, this is the... In fact, it was to be a Yamaha 1100, it's now a Yamaha 750. They changed, they decided the outright class was far too competitive and they got themselves onto a 750 Yamaha, Rob Morehouse, the Queenslander, and Peter Walker, the young New South Wales rider who showed a lot of promise a year ago. Still rides extremely well, but uh, just hasn't continued to come forward as much as he did in the previous 12 months. But uh, they qualified a bit down in the field. They were 27th in back, 60.3, and they were one of the teams a bit perplexed as to why the bike wasn't revving as readily as they would have wished. The, uh, the flag emblem on the top of the helmet announces that it's uh, Rob Morehouse who rides one of the big furiously fast 750 Yamaha races. Roger Hayes in fifth place. David Robbins in the saddle at the moment, but Hayes has done the final share of the, the bike and they all the riders are just five hours, in fact, uh, five minutes. In fact, it's now down to about four minutes from the finish of this year's Castrol 6R. In fourth place is Robbins and Hayes on one. Out of Rothman's corner, a short pit straight in behind them, number 10, Gary Thomas, Clive Knight, Kawasaki, Z1R. Yeah, Challenge from Kawasaki really never did come to fruition. Where's Cooley going through 11, 23, as uh, Jennifer Coates and Deborah Brinkley riding, the all-women team. Yes. Robbins again. Then in front of uh, David Robbins on one is Len Athley on number nine. He's in third place. That's taking out Dennis Neal, who's been disqualified, but who has appealed. I've been written around the circuit as a pillion passenger on an 1100 Yamaha with Len Athley. And we did 65 seconds lap, second laps, two up and doing 140 kilometres an hour up the hill through that right-hand kink. Len, really the most impressive thing about that ride behind him, and he runs an advanced riding school here at Amaru Park, so few probably have done more laps at Amaru Park than Len Attlee. Um, but the most impressive thing about that was the preciseness of his line, the absolute certainty of the line, and then the way that Wherever you were on the circuit, you were either full, you were full on something. You're either full on the brakes or full on the throttle. You never seem to feather it anywhere. You're absolutely full on the throttle out of Honda. Down then to Rothman's corner, suddenly absolutely full on the brakes. And everybody, look at it, weave under brakes and underneath him. Absolutely flying underneath him was Craig Blackburn and Glenn Fenton on 27. In front of Len Attlee, though, is bike number 12. In second place, Greg Pretty, Jim Budd. Just one place off perfection. They qualified fourth fastest, 57.9, but uh, have just been that touch off the pace today, set by the furious the fast pace of the Suzuki 1000 of Alan Hales. And probably the difference is the determination and the application to the job by Alan Hales on the Suzuki. Now one and a half minutes to go in this 10th Castrol 6-hour classic. And uh, Jim Budd riding, being attacked actually, positively <laughs> threatened by Malcolm Campbell and Rodney Cox, a uh, 
Tasmanian pair on bike number 16, the Honda CB900 and down, a fall, one minute from the end of the race in Ron Hodgson corner. The rider, as you can see, has been thrown clear. He's high-sided himself over the bike. And uh, let's have a look at that again in the last minute and a half of the Castrol 6R. Look at the bike. Rolling over and over sideways, throwing the rider clear, though, happily. And how quickly riders quickly found their way around. The yellow flags are out. It's 40 seconds before the end of the race. And frankly, I'm surprised there haven't been more falls. And this is the man heading for the flag. He's probably going to have to do one extra lap. It's half a minute to go, but this is Alan Hales, who is co-ridden by Neil Chivers. And through, through onto his last lap, incidentally, the bike that's come down there is bike number two, the disqualified Dennis Neal, Honda 900 of him and Alan Decker, but Hales on his final lap. His greatest ambition on the way to realisation, because he's a production bike race specialist. This is all he does, and to him, this race is the pinnacle of success and of challenge. And Alan Hales threw it away last year, but hasn't made it one fault this year. Didn't change a tyre. Most of his opponent teams did. He's going to give Suzuki their first win in the race. Honda have won it once, Kawasaki five times, Yamaha once, and then BMW and Triumph once each. And now victory coming to Suzuki. Down to Rothman's corner. The chequered flag awaits him. Alan Hales and Neil Chivers, son of Doug Chivers, sharing the victory in the Castrol 6R. The flag is waved, of course, at the end of the 6Rs, and uh, Greg Pretty on number 12, and uh, Jim Budd, Jim Budd riding the bike, will take second place, but into the pits goes Alan Hales, and he will be absolutely jubilant. A great effort. Alan Hale's friend there in the blue dress and with the laurel garland. And we're going to hear from Alan Hales and Neil Chivers. Neil Chivers and Alan Hales, first victory in the six hour. Alan, how do you feel? Great, great. No, was, uh, the, bike, the bike performed great. It was just uh, a terrific day's ride for us. Uh, I'd like to thank... Um, Early tyre man uh, Frank Maddich, uh, he was a big help. Suzuki Cornell for the bike, it's a beautiful bike, it can go another six hour race. Great Pacific Finance, they're one of our sponsors, and a whole host of other people, Norm Pigeon, who helped put the thing together, and all the guys that, that give us a hand, uh, plus all the guys that just come out here on the day. Alan, is there any truth that now that you've got the victory, you might even retire? Well, I'll have to think hard about it, it's been a great ride. Neil, second victory for you in the six hour, how do you feel? Oh, tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Uh, all I can say is that uh, Suzuki won for that GS1000, ran like clockwork all day. As Alan said, I could do another six hour race, running on castor oil. And the uh, Pirelli tyres were just magnificent all day. As you know, we didn't have to change a tyre. And both of us wore AGV helmets, which were comfortable all day. It was just tremendous effort from the Suzuki organisation and everybody else that helped us. Well, the victory team, Alan Howes and Neil Shivers on the Suzuki GS1000. Well, what a great win. What a great six-hour race for the tenth six-hour. There you see the results. Suzuki, Yamaha and Yamaha. But first victory outright for Suzuki. And the first one for Alan Hales, who's tried so hard throughout the history of this event. And in behind them, the race within a race, the 750 class. There, Wayne Gardner, John Pace, Victors, Kawasaki, dominant in that class, with Yamaha 750 bringing up third place with the Australian international Barry Smith riding, but not able to sustain the pace.